Hello, my name is Mark Cornwall. I'm Professor of Modern European History here at the University of Southampton. And I, in this uh, taster lecture, I'm going to introduce you to the subject of treason, uh, history of treason, but also the history of the Habsburg Empire. And these are two subjects on which I teach here at Southampton. I'm combining them together in this um, short lecture for you, just to give you an idea of um, the kind of topics, exciting topics you can investigate when you come here to study. Now, the subject of treason is a very topical one. Um, and I say this because the idea has recently come up that the British treason law, um, which um, is still in place, should be um, improved, modernised for the present day. You see here the document that was produced a couple of years ago by some MPs to suggest this modernization of treason in Britain. And it's very much in connection with uh, terrorism. So treason is, um, in fact, a subject which has not gone away. It's ubiquitous in human history. It was a crime in ancient Rome. Uh, and recently, if you think about uh, people like Edward Snowden, the whistleblower Edmund, uh, uh, Edward Snowden, or perhaps he is a traitor, it depends how you look at him, it's still um, very much um, a present day topic. It usually comes to our attention, though, in two ways. Firstly, with hostile political rhetoric, uh, attacking your enemies, usually this is in politics, as traitors, and secondly, as a crime which results in a very public and sensational trial. Now, this might suggest to you that treason has a clear cut definition, but in fact, it's always a very slippery uh, uh, concept in how it's interpreted, as we shall see. And I'm going to start with one key interpreter of treason in English history, and that's the 18th century legal expert William. Blackstone, who you see here. In book four of his legal commentaries in 1769, Blackstone set out um, a long-standing, long-lasting interpretation of high treason with reference to the English Treason Act of 1351. And what were his main ideas then? Well, especially uh, Blackstone stressed that treason was about breaking allegiance, which was owed to the king, in a fundamental way. Blackstone also stressed that one needed to be very precise when interpreting treason in law, for as he wrote, uh, if the crime of high treason be indeterminate, this alone is sufficient to make any government degenerate into arbitrary power. In other words, if the concept of treason was left too vague, it opened the door to state tyranny. Now, the main purpose of the 1351 English Treason Act had been to prevent such tyranny by the king. But this hadn't prevented uh, the legal misuse of treason down through the centuries, for example, by the Tudors under Henry VIII, for example, but especially after the English Civil War in the 1640s, when a victorious parliament had radically rewritten the law in order to execute King Charles I as a traitor. Commenting on this 1351 law, Blackstone stressed that in Britain, treason was a crime mainly against the monarch, killing the king, aiding the king's enemies, etc. But he did imply that monarchs too could commit treason if they broke their side of the contract. People then might legitimately revolt. So English treason law um, has, through the centuries, always focused on the monarch. And this is a rather unusual um, fact. Uh, but it's useful for us, I think, as a basis from which to rethink what we mean by treason, and especially to think about how it surfaced and evolved in another context in the late Habsburg Empire uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Implicit in what Blackstone wrote uh, were some general points which I think we can apply to all, all treason. And the first of these is that treason was and is the most horrific crime imaginable. And I'm just going to give you one example of this. If we look at the uh, depiction of traitors and treason in Dante's Inferno, Dante, of course, being a leading Italian poet and writer of the early 14th century. 
In exploring uh, the nine circles of hell in Dante's Inferno, um, Dante found, and this is Dante going down into hell in this poem, Dante found uh, traitors, the, 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 um, the class of traitors in the ninth or deepest zone of hell, uh, furthest down, furthest down in the earth. And this was the zone inhabited by Judas, uh, by Brutus, the assassin of Caesar, and by Satan himself. We see here uh, on the right the depiction of uh, Dante visiting hell, seeing, finding Saint, uh, Satan in the uh, ninth zone, the, the zone of traitors. So this suggested to contemporaries and has suggested very much ever since the, um, the degree to which uh, traitors are viewed as uh, major heretics and criminals in society. And duly, the punishment for treason has always been the worst imaginable. Uh, in English law, uh, in English history, it was often uh, through the centuries, it was, it was associated with hanging, drawing and quartering, which you see here in the centre, centre, central picture, uh, because it was the ultimate immoral act against the community and it had to be well publicised as such. Now, another point that we might make about treason is that um, aside from the allegiances broken by the traitor, treason has always involved some kind of power struggle in the state. And it's also about, therefore, about upholding state security in some fashion. Here, those who are labelled as traitors while grossly trying to violate domestic security often have international connections. They may be working with the enemy, uh, enemy forces abroad to undermine the native community or state to which they owe their allegiance. Now, an, a last point which Blackstone brings up is really it shows us that lawyers have always wanted treason to be as precise as possible in the law. But there's always a tension here because of how treason uh, will be interpreted, for it's mainly the state which constructs the meaning of treason, twisting the interpretation to meet its own ends. Um, at best, we might identify some clear cases of treason in the recent past, where the national community has felt its interests legitimately threatened. For example, the case of the Norwegian fascist Quisling, who you see here. Um, Quisling, which uh, his very name became a byword for traitor, um, even, he, even if he always claimed that he wasn't a traitor to Norway. At worst, states have often invented traitors for their own purposes. For example, uh, the, the show trials invented by Stalin uh, in the mid 20th century. Or the state carefully constructs the treason law or interprets the treason law in order to get a conviction. And this is the case with the last man to be executed for treason in Britain, William Joyce, who we see here on the right, um, uh, the fascist who would um, broadcast uh, anti-British propaganda from uh, Germany during the war, he was executed for um, holding a British passport in 1946. Now let's, so this is just some general points which introduce you to thinking about what is treason, but let's transpose these ideas now to the late Habsburg Empire in Eastern Europe, a huge empire which as you see here stretched from Switzerland in the west over to Romania, uh, from Poland up in the north down to Serbia or the, uh, the Adriatic in the south. Traditionally, the Habsburg Empire has been seen as a state in crisis, which then collapsed in 1918 due to nationalist agitation. But recent research has also shown or suggested that there was an actual vitality about this empire, uh, that many citizens felt a loyalty to the Habsburg state, to the empire, even right, right up to the end, really, so that it wasn't uh, as doomed as we might think. But we should, I think, I don't think we can avoid noticing the degree of disloyalty across many communities in this empire in its last uh, century or so, and the way that allegiance is slowly shifted in a nationalist direction by the early 20th century. 
If we think about the topic of treason in the Habsburg Empire, it's very illuminating for what it can tell us. Um, for example, if we start in 1848, join the revolutions in Central Europe and go right up to the end of the empire in 1918, these two um, start and end points were fundamental periods of disloyalty, periods of revolution and, of course, uh, war, First World War at the very end. The state authorities felt immensely threatened during these periods and they defined, uh, defined loyalty and disloyalty uh, very rigidly during these periods too. So treason in wartime we might very much expect, um, we might expect very much that it was um, identified, it was prosecuted uh, by the state. So it's rather interesting that in the Habsburg Empire we also get an explosion of treason trials in peacetime before 1914, before the war breaks out, uh, and also back in the night, uh, late 19th century. Uh, this suggests to me a, a regime already in crisis during these decades, or at least a regime which is, uh, was searching for weapons to manage new security threats. And I think um, the Hasburg Empire is rather unusual in this regard. You don't get the same uh, degree of trials, um, the treason trials in Germany or in Britain. There's the case of Roger Casement in Britain in the First World War. Um, you don't get the same uh, 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 multitude of trials that you get in the Hasburg Empire. Russia, possibly a little bit more similar to the Hasburg Empire, but um, we need more research on that area. My own research here has focused very much on how treason is, um, how the treason weapon is wielded in the Habsburg Empire. And especially in my research and in my teaching at Southampton, I've asked when did the idea of traitors surface? Where did they surface? Why did they surface? And what were the criteria used for measuring treasonous activity? So what then was Habsburg treason law? We need to kind of get into the law a little bit here. Just think about uh, what the law on treason was. For most of the period, 1848 to 1918, uh, the key treason law was paragraph 58 in the Austrian Criminal Code of 1852. This code had come out of the horrors of 18, the 1848 revolutions and it lasted right until 1918. The Habsburg Empire was split into two parts in 1867, Austria on the one hand, Hungary on the other, and Hungary did get its own uh, criminal code in 1878, and there the treason law was much the same, in fact, as in the Austrian um, half of the empire. So I'm going to focus here on, on the Austrian half of the empire uh, in my examples, really. If English treason law was fixated on the monarch. Austrian treason law was typical of continental law. It was a mixture of clauses that prosecuted those who threatened the internal or external security of the state. And often these two aspects were termed respectively Hochverrat, this is in German, Hochverrat meaning internal uh, treason, internal threats, and Landesverrat, which was more about um, treason linked to threats from abroad. Both of these concepts, Hochverrat and Landesverrat, both, both of them are descended from the Roman idea of treason or Roman crimes of treason, but early Germanic law had then supplemented this, emphasising treason as the breaking of some allegiance in the community. Now, I've already mentioned that in English treason law, there was really just one object of treason, which was um, a crime against the monarch. In the Austrian law of 1852, and this is similar to other treason laws on the continent, treason could be committed against three objects, matching three clauses of the law. And each of these clauses covered a particular crime against the state community. And we see them here. Firstly, yes, treason meant a crime against the monarch, usually assassination or trying to um, uh, wound the monarch, stopping him um, continuing his uh, activity as a ruler. Secondly, treason meant a crime against the government of the state, where the aim was to violently change the government. And thirdly, 
and rather importantly in the Habsburg Empire, treason meant a crime against state territory, often in collusion with the enemy. Now, first two of these clauses had long been present in Austrian treason law going back um, several centuries, but Clause C uh, was wholly new in the 1850s, and as we shall see, it would be exploited very much by authorities, uh, by the authorities in the early 20th century. So I'm going to show a little bit in what follows uh, how treason was manipulated by the state and um, focusing on two examples. Firstly, treason in Hungary during the 1848 revolutions. And secondly, one of the major treason trials that took place, uh, which was in Croatia, in Zagreb, in 1909. But first, uh, let me just say a little bit about uh, a traditional example of treason, which is um, where the monarch was attacked um, as uh, um, the monarch was attacked and that, that particular crime of treason. In February 1853, the young emperor Franz Joseph was taking a lunchtime stroll on the city walls in Vienna. And suddenly he was attacked with a kitchen knife by Janos Libeni, a young Hungarian tailor. The assassin was wrestled to the ground by Franz Joseph's aide-de-camp, together with a passer-by, but the emperor was left concussed and bleeding from the neck. The authorities interpreted this and publicised this, this treason in a very particular way. Firstly, uh, they said divine providence had intervened to save the emperor. A devotional picture, or picture of the assassination, which is now in the museum in Vienna, showed this incident. We see it on the left here. It was very dramatic, um, uh, showing the attack, the actual attack, and the uh, two individuals intervening to save the emperor. But in this picture, we should note that what has not survived was that originally at the top of the picture, there was the image of Christ and God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, surveying everything and ensuring the failure of the treachery. So here, uh, uh, in this depiction, as in earlier centuries, treason was interpreted um, as something of the devil's work, with the Almighty on the side of order. To emphasise this deliverance from um, the devil, one result of this attack by Libeni was um, that a special church was built in Vienna, uh, which we see here on the right. This is the Votivkirche, which you can still go and see. Um, it spires rising right up to heaven and um, still a very um, impressive um, architectural statement in the city of Vienna. But that's that's one aspect of how the um, the state interpreted treason, this this uh, div, uh, uh, freedom from or liberation from uh, from the work of the devil. But otherwise, a second point would be that the state managed this incident of treason in a rather arbitrary fashion. It didn't use the new penal code, which had just come in a year earlier. It didn't use paragraph 58. Rather, the state used laws from ex the existing state of emergency, which were there in Vienna, coming out of the 1848 revolutions. In, in other words, martial law, the um, rules of martial law were used. And on this basis, Libeni, the, the assassin, was quickly tried by a military court, and he was hanged before a large crowd. You can see a a drawing of his hanging uh, here, I'm afraid. The regime also typically assumed that Libeni's act was part of a wider Hungarian plot, and the result was several of Libeni's Hungarian friends were arrested, they were tried for treason, and they were given, given long, long prison sentences, even though uh, the evidence against them was really quite circumstantial. Anyway, the point of this incident, uh, the Libani assassination attempt of 1853, was that it, it shows us clearly the power and the moral dimensions uh, which are always there in, uh, in the crime of treason. These were very well publicised at the time, uh, that um, uh, treason is, a, is a, an immoral act, and but it also shows uh, that treason is also a very political act. It's always tied up with some... 
um, tension between the state and some of its citizens. Let's look a little bit further at treason then in the 1848 revolutions with the Hungarian example. Uh, the events in Hungary are the best example of this. Uh, and in short, what I mean is that when the 1848 revolution broke out, Hungary had managed to secure home rule from imperial authorities in Vienna. But then in 1849, when uh, Vienna tried to reverse this home rule, Hungary under the charismatic leader Kossuth, Kossuth declared full independence from the empire. Now, this swift transfer of power back and fro accelerated the rhetoric about traitors on all sides. For example, the Habsburg authorities quickly accused Hungary of treachery, of violating imperial allegiance by trying to break away. In fact, by, by actually breaking away and declaring independence. Kossuth, in turn, accused the Habsburg dynasty of breaking the contract of home rule, which had been granted to Hungary in 1848. So we see here that treason was about breaking a contract on both sides. When the imperial power was restored by 1849, by late 1849, the Habsburg authorities set about using the charge of treason as one way of publicly asserting their moral victory and publicly condemning disloyalty. The best example of this, which I want to give you, is the treason trial of Lajos Botiani, who you see here, who had been Hungarian prime minister for six months in 1848. After a long investigation, he was brought to trial in August 1849. This was in a military court again, um, so a strict military interpretation of his treason uh, was there in line with the prevailing state of emergency. What, were, what then were the charges against Bottiani? Uh, he, he was singled out for disobeying his monarch and for illegally usurping his powers, usurping the powers of the monarch. And what they meant by that was that he had sent special Hungarian envoys abroad, illegally raised recruits for a Hungarian army, issued a special Hungarian currency, which we see here. Um, but the key extra arguments against Bottiani were in fact those of Landesverrat, uh, collusion um, with the enemy and um, very much linked to trying to um, break up the empire and doing nothing to stop civil war developing. Bottiani at the trial um, uh, acted at his own defence and he argued he had acted in 1848 uh, in a way which matched the confused circumstances of the time uh, and tried to protect imperial interests, in fact. He argued also he had always tried to act legally and said that the monarch could have dismissed him as a prime minister at any time, but had not done so. Now, this was true, but it had no impact on the final verdict. Bottiani was found guilty of treason on the basis of nine clear acts, and he was sentenced to death. And typically, as with um, the other examples I've given you of traitors such as Quisling or William Joyce, Bottiani himself declared at the trial that posterity would judge his actual intentions. It would, uh, it would be left to later generations to judge him. Hanging as a traitor was a very uh, that, that was the, um, the main uh, punishment for traitors in the Habsburg Empire, hanging, but that was a very dishonourable death. And therefore, Bottiani, on the eve of his execution, tried to commit suicide by cutting his own throat. Here he asserted, I would say, his own moral stance by really taking the initiative. And um, this did have an impact. The next day, he was duly shot rather than hanged, uh, being shot, being thought to be um, uh, 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 a more honourable way to go. And we see his execution <clears throat> or depiction of his execution in the picture here uh, uh, with Bottiani in a very heroic pose. Well, obviously, this was not the case at the time. It's a very um, artificial picture. This, uh, this was a man who had tried to commit suicide. Uh, he had to be helped 
to the execution, etc. He wasn't hard. He was hardly in the kind of pose that you see here when he died. But anyway, in this case, we see the regime using uh, uh, Bottiani as a scapegoat, as a terrorist, to send out a message um, to the public because he had been a very public figure. It's also useful just to think that about this, that the Hasvig regime also interpreted his treason retrospectively, um, judging his um, intentions during the revolution to have been evil. But for most Hungarians, um, this whole incident, the way that Botiani died, he would be treated as a martyr. He would go down as a martyr and uh, the Habsburgs would be seen as thoroughly tyrannous in how they uh, behaved in this period by Hungarians. Now, the aftermath of all this tells us quite a lot about the outlook of the regime. Uh, on the one hand, the regime now, the Hasburg regime, proceeded to strengthen its treason law with paragraph 58 in the 1852, 1852 code, where clause C, if you remember, was about trying to break up the state. And treason was specifically defined now in a new way as plotting to break territory away from the state or to foment civil war. On the other hand, the regime did quickly see the benefits of some compromise in the 1850s. I mean, after uh, using, uh, wielding uh, such a blunt instrument as treason law, the point was, how do you come back from that? And in the 1850s, the Habsburg Empire, the Habsburg regime did uh, rehabilitate some Hungarian emigres and encourage these traitors to return home to get back to some uh, normality in this empire. And I think that did have some impact in uh, um, achieving a certain stability in uh, Central Europe um, in the 1850s and even afterwards. Now, the evidence does suggest that treason law in the Habsburg Empire was used less frequently uh, in the following decades um, under civilian rule in the late 19th century, but it could always be resurrected when the state felt threatened. Now, one example of this is the socialist uh, trial, the Socialist Treason Trial of 1870. Um, in 1870, some Austrian socialist leaders were put on trial for treason under um, paragraph 58b, in other words, for trying to violently overturn the government. The prosecution claimed that through socialist street protests, the socialists were aiming violently to overthrow the government and that they had dangerous international links too. The verdict in this trial was guilty and it matched the regime's desire, in fact, to completely destroy socialism. So they're using treason law as a way to remove uh, internal enemies. Um, the pictures here show the courtroom where uh, this trial took place. And also there's the court building, which is still there today in Vienna. <clears throat> But in this power struggle again of 1870, it was the socialists who finally secured, we might say, victory, secured the moral high ground because the Supreme Court uh, in Vienna overturned the verdict of guilty. And so here we find the label of traitor was uh, turned on its head. Um, Austrian socialists um, came out of this quite victorious and they get, gained a certain respectability um, because of this. Um, in the following decades, socialists would become much less of a threat and would be incorporated into the political system in the Habsburg Empire, at least in the Austrian half of the empire. After this failure of 1870, perhaps we might expect the Habsburg regime to desist from using treason law. But surprisingly, uh, paragraph 58, this treason paragraph, was used increasingly uh, by the turn of the century from 1900 um, to handle nationalist traitors in the empire who seemed to be in league with foreign enemies. Nationalists were the key uh, ideological traitors in the eyes of the Habsburg regime. And I'm just going to end with a, a final example of this, just to give you some idea of a particular, uh, particularly 
uh, long-lasting and important treason trial. The best example was the Zagreb treason trial of 1909. Here we see uh, the trial with all of the um, many defendants uh, there in the courtroom. At this trial, 50 prominent Serbs in Croatia were charged under paragraph 58c, and they were accused of being traitors in league with the foreign state of Serbia. They were accused of plotting to break Croatia away from the empire in order to fulfil Serbia's dream of creating a greater Serbia in the Balkans. Some people at the time equated this treason trial uh, with France's Dreyfus affair, one British historian at the time called it one of the grossest travesties of justice in modern times. Because this was a long-lasting public scandal, it was a trial of 150 days, uh, the whole trial transcript went to 6,000 pages. It involved forged documents, and the Habsburg authorities deliberately pursued the charge of treason, even when the evidence was clearly unreliable. In the Dreyfus affair in France, it was the loyalty of Jews that was especially suspect. Here it was the loyalty of Serbs in the Habsburg Empire, who were stereotyped by the state as treacherously transferring their allegiance to an enemy state, the enemy state of Serbia. Now this case tells us, I think, a lot about the Habsburg regime's increasing alarm in the decade before the First World War, about foreign security threats and the threat of hidden uh, domestic enemies. In the Zagreb trial, we see treason, in fact, as something largely invented and manipulated by the state to suit its own ends. In other words, the state needed traitors at this time in 1908-1909, and it actively sought out these people in rural Serb communities in Croatia near the border with Bosnia. Here we see uh, one of the locations, this little village of Virgin Most. This is a, an interesting postcard from the time. Um, and by stereotyping Serbs as traitors, the regime expected to strengthen its power in Croatia uh, and also to portray Serbia before Europe as an immoral state which threatened the peace of Europe. Did the prosecution really believe that those on trial were traitors? Well, probably. But it also came down to consciously interpreting Serb behaviour as treason under paragraph 58. The defence lawyers at the trial, and you see the defence team here, the defence lawyers at this trial asked, were those who promoted Serb culture really disloyal to the Habsburg Emperor? Couldn't individuals have a double allegiance to perhaps to Austria and to Serbia? Was their cultural activity really tantamount to trying to break up the Habsburg Empire? In short, could any breaches of loyalty be branded as treason? And we see one example in a cartoon of uh, making a mockery of this to say, well, um, if somebody was, uh, for example, here urinating against a police box, is that also treason? Um, is that also uh, anti-dynastic? As with the Dreyfus affair, the Zagreb treason trial, which was very big at the time, ended very messily for the Habsburg regime. Um, the trial was wholly weighted towards the prosecution. The judge was totally biased. The defence were allowed few witnesses, so that 30 of the accused were found guilty uh, and were given long prison sentences. But as in the 1870 socialist trial, the moral victory of the regime was very short-lived. The documents used in the trial were suddenly exposed as forgeries, so the convicted had to be released. So this, might, might, we might say, was a moral victory for those who'd been put on trial. But even so, there was no real resolution here. And this is similar to the Dreyfus affair in France. The convicted were never pardoned. Many Serbs would conclude that the Habsburg Empire was a tyrannical state, which did not deserve their allegiance. Um, and thus, uh, we could say the use of treason law in the Habsburg Empire here again, uh, it was a blunt instrument which backfired on the state authorities.
Only four years later, in 1913, on the eve of the First World War, the Austrian Ministry of Justice, Minister of Justice publicly complained that treason law, uh, treason law of the empire was not fit for purpose. It didn't match the way uh, the relationship um, between it didn't match the relationship between the Habsburg state and society, um, which had changed dramatically over the past century. But despite this warning, uh, the Habsburg Empire continued to use treason law during the First World War in major treason trials, targeting various individuals or groups in society as disloyal. And if, uh, a good example of this would be the Sarajevo trial of the assassins of uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914, where um, it led on to many uh, mass trials of Serbs in the south of the empire. So just one or two conclusions now from this short lecture. I know it's taken you quite deep into the subject of treason, but it's given you kind of, um, I hope, some, some things to think about. What should we think about as the meaning of treason then? Um, this, uh, the meaning of treason is a book by the novelist and journalist Rebecca West, who you see, see here in the middle of the picture. Um, and I wonder what we could learn about uh, the meaning of treason from what I've been saying. Well, firstly, I would say that viewing the Habsburg Empire through this prism of treason supplies us with some new arguments for suggesting a regime in crisis, or at least one where the state faced uh, steady challenges to its authority and resorted to a blunt instrument, treason law, to bolster their, that security. Um, possibly in time of revolution or war, uh, we might expect uh, uh, such treason law to be used. But during peacetime, under legal norms, um, this was rather unusual, where the state was expecting allegiance in return for um, uh, uh, giving protection to the sub to its subjects. In peacetime, it was a far more dangerous tactic to use treason law to manage state security um, and um, think that there would be some moral benefits or some power benefits coming out of that. Secondly, where should we perhaps think about late, the late Habsburg Empire in perhaps a general history of treason through the centuries. And the history of treason has not been very well researched. There are lots of case studies, but thinking across the centuries is really quite an interesting thing to do. Well, in, in ideological terms, we find that the Habsburg state certainly identified the main traitors as nationalists. And uh, very particular to this period of the late 19th century, early 20th century, it's the same with Britain, where those who were traitors are really the Irish nationalists of the time. But another way to think about this is perhaps that in defining or thinking about Hasbro treason, perhaps we're thinking about, uh, it makes us think about the um, Hasbrook Empire as um, being part of or, or, or being there in, in history as um, being part of a transitional era through to a modern age. Um, what I mean by that is that in the Hasbrook Empire we see old ideas of high treason being present, for example, attacks on the monarch or the government, but also we see examples of new ideas of treason, like collusion with the enemy or portraying state secrets as well. Now, obviously, that, is all, that had always been there in examples of treason, the examples of espionage and betraying secrets. But this uh, second dimension, this idea of collusion with the enemy, this idea of betraying secrets, that was the type of treason which really predominated in the mid-20th century or in the 20th century right up to today. Um, so in that way, I might say that the Hasbro Empire lies between, in history of treason, lies between these two concepts of treason. The old idea, which was very much linked to attacking the monarch and the government, the new idea, the newer idea, which was very much about collusion with enemies abroad and betraying secrets of the state. So... 
Treason through the ages has always had an enduring core, but it has also constantly, I would say, evolved and changed in line with the security demands of the state. As the German journalist who you see here on the right, Margaret Bovary, once quipped in her book about treason, which she wrote in the 1950s, the meaning of treason changes as the wheel of history turns. So treason is um, enduring. It, there's a continuity about it, but it is also always specific to particular periods of history and um, linked to the different um, um, types of security or insecurity of various regimes. So I hope this um, uh, venture, this little um, uh, journey into the history of treason has whetted your appetite a little bit about coming to Southampton and we very much look forward to welcoming you here in the near future. Thank you very much. <laughs>